Hello, everyone, and welcome today to the live broadcast Cure Education Patient Lung Cancer Webinar. I'm Dr. Leora Horn, an associate professor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center here in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'll be your moderator for this evening's event. We're pleased to bring you this webcast presented by Cure and sponsored by AstraZeneca and the Lung Cancer Research Foundation. I have a couple of important announcements before we begin. Um, first of all, this webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing it in the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window, and we'll be taking questions and answering them throughout the hour. I am pleased to be joined today by Dr. Jyothi Patel, um, Professor of Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois, the place that we normally go around this time of year to see ASCO, and someone from my own backyard, um, Ali Shafa, a licensed clinical social worker and member of the Patient Education Programs Review Committee at the Lung Cancer Research um, Foundation. Thank you both um, for joining me today. So um, there has been a lot going on um, in the world um, with COVID-19 and also recently at ASCO with the updates that we had um, on our lung cancer patients. And maybe I'll start with you, Jyothi, and just thinking about ASCO and what we saw this past week. If you could pick one presentation, I think we'll get to a lot of the data. What was the one thing that you were most excited about to see at ASCO this year? So certainly leading up to ASCO, it's been a pretty exciting time. We know that there have been multiple sort of press releases and drugs that were approved in May. Um, but really, I think the one that is so impact, the single study that was so impactful to patients is um, the use of adjuvant osmertinib in the Adora study. Um, this is a complete paradigm change for our patients and really brings targeted therapy to the curative setting for a subset of patients. So, yeah, so I think I agree with you. I was very excited about the Adora. And the, just to remind those people who are on the chat, it was a randomized phase three trial um, that was comparing um, osimertinib after chemotherapy to placebo in patients who had EGFR mutations. And what the study showed us was that there was an improvement in disease-free survival for patients who got osimertinib, um, a very significant improvement in uh, disease-free survival. Um, and we're, we're waiting to hear about the overall survival data. And, you know, Ali, you do a lot of work with patient groups and patient advocates. Do you think it's enough for an oncologist to go to their patients tomorrow and tell them we've got a drug that's going to prolong your disease or prolong the time until your disease comes back? Or do you think that patients are going to say, wait, I'm not going to do this because it's meant to help increase the chance of cure and we don't have that data yet? What, what should we be telling our patients, how should we be thinking about this data? Yeah, what a great question. And I think it's a collaborative conversation. And so the medical providers can bring their expertise of what they know and of what has just been um, released through ASCO. And the patient can bring their expertise of self and what's important to them in their own life to have a discussion to share information, ask questions, so that at the end of any conversation, a patient and their family can feel empowered with information to make what feels like an informed choice instead of a have to. So I think part of what I'd invite is the providers to help patients understand how this data applies to them and their particular individual medical history, medical risk, to give them support and feedback to the decision. I also invite if there's a time sensitivity of the decision, that can be a really helpful factor as well. Some patients feel as though there's an urgency to make decisions when that's not always the case. So as providers, you could include that. This is something for you to think about and you have this amount of time, it's not urgent, or this is something that you really need to consider and decide within the next couple of days, for example. That knowing the time frame I think, can provide a lot of important 
for a patient to make decisions and also to follow up when they have additional questions. So, Jyothi, I had two interesting questions in clinic on Monday, and I'm, I'm curious to see how you're going to answer um, these questions. So, one was from a patient who saw the Adora data, but she's about a year out from finishing adjuvant chemo, and she asked me, do I need to go on this now? So, what, what would you tell her? So, this is really tough. So, just to... Um, to remind everyone, so the Adora study was looking at patients with resected lung tumors, and they got up to three years of osimertinib, and osimertinib is the TKI that we know is approved in the frontline setting. Um, the study allowed for chemotherapy, and we think that chemotherapy is a standard of care after surgery for patients with stage 2 and 3 disease and certain patients with stage 1B disease. So all of these patients were lumped. The primary endpoint of the study was looking at patients with stage two and three disease. And remember that these patients are at high risk of relapse. So, you know, I think lung cancer is always tough when we talk about, yes, it was early stage, but even with stage one disease, up to 30% of patients will unfortunately suffer relapse. And the stakes are pretty high. We've shown since um, the early 2000s that chemotherapy after surgery decreases that risk of relapse. But honestly, those gains are, are somewhat small when you sort of see new gains with, with recent um, trials. But those gains include survival benefits anywhere from about 3 to up to maybe 12 or 13 percent in patients with, with more advanced stage disease, so like stage 3 disease. What we saw with the osimertinib after three years was we decreased the risk of recurrence so significantly. So for patients with 1B disease by uh, what was something we call a hazard ratio of 0.5, so that means that recur. For patients with stage um, one or stage three disease where the likelihood of recurrence is almost 70%, that re reduction in risk was almost 90 was almost 90%. Um, so really, really positive, positive studies. And so the trial was designed such that patients needed to start one of those drugs within, I think, 10 weeks of completion of surgery um, or after chemotherapy. And so certainly that year window is out. Um, we know that the risk of recurrence is highest in the first two years, but it doesn't drop off completely. There's still a risk of recurrence over those two to five years, and then at five years we think it's generally a new cancer. Giving astoundingly positive studies, it would you know I, I understand exactly what Leora is saying. Like that's a tough question. So ha are they outside of the window of greatest risk? And at this juncture, are we just adding osimertinib and adding toxicities? And the toxicities are mild, but they're there every single day. You're taking a pill that causes some fatigue and rash and diarrhea. And so where is that piece? We know that recurrent disease. Um, though very treatable, is can be devastating, right? So disease in the brain, disease in the bone, any symptomatic disease can be really difficult. And so I think it's a very weighted conversation. Honestly, Leora, for someone with early stage, so 1B, um, certainly I, I think I would be less inclined to have a, you know, to think of or to prescribe it. But in someone with stage 3 disease where the risk of recurrence is so significant, um, it may be reasonable uh, to consider. Um, currently, it's not FDA approved, so you can't get it, unfortunately. Um, but um, I think it's something that um, that certainly is emotionally compelling to me, despite um, the lack of data there. Yeah, so we, we had a long talk that it's not in that approved indication. This patient was 2A, and so we, we kind of settled on, you know, your you know, 17 months post-surgery and you're 12 months post-chemo. And I think at this time that we could do more harm than good. Um, and so, you know, I said, let's just kind of wait because we also don't know how it impacts the long-term chance of cure. And at this point, you're already halfway through where you where you would have been potentially um, on osimertinib. So I guess the other tough question that I had, and maybe, uh, Ali, I know that you're not a physician, but you do have a great insight into what patients are thinking about. I had a patient who was ELK positive, so not EGFR, 
would not have qualified for this trial who is finishing adjuvant um, chemotherapy. And we've talked about the Alchemist trial for them. And the Alchemist trial is the big cooperative group trial that's comparing crizotinib to standard of care um, for patients who are ALK positive. And he turned around and said, well, shouldn't I get one of the better ALK inhibitors like the Adora study? And shouldn't I just go on electinib? Because that's what it, what's FDA that's what's FDA approved and is better than crizotinib. So how, you know, as Jyothi mentioned before, before ASCO, we had salpercatinib approved for patients who are ret fusion positive. We've also had the approval of cafmatinib. Finally, we've got something for patients who have uh, the MET exon 14 skipping mutation in their tumors. What do we do for all these other drivers? Because we're gonna have patients asking us those questions and where do we direct patients? What should we be telling them? Yeah, so there's that raises the point that chemotherapy or targeted therapy or immunotherapy is one part of a comprehensive care plan. And so where there can be is how do you help patients, how do you help families have additional information and support and community? What are the additional actions that people can take that might also support their care? And so helping them to see what else can you do in addition to some of these treatment regimens how else can you support yourself and take care of yourself and some of the additional methods, nutrition, rest, stress management, counseling, emotional well-being, connection to community, peer support, um, fitness, movement, exercise, some of the additional therapies. These are also part of the care plans and care regimens that will patients benefit from having the consideration and the conversation. And it means a lot when physicians bring in these topics as well. So patients and family members can understand the importance of these actions in addition to some of the targeted therapies and how people are making choices. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I don't know about you, Jyoti, but I, I, I said to my patient, I said, I think this is even a bigger reason to go on Alchemist so we can answer these questions and figure out what we need to do for you after you have finished chemotherapy. Um, I hope this doesn't become a reason that patients don't do chemotherapy because we don't have enough data of substituting chemotherapy for targeted agents or immunotherapy. We know that those trials are ongoing, um, but, but hopefully we're gonna get that. So other data that we saw um, at ASCO, you sort of had that perfect segue, Ali, saying, immunotherapy and chemotherapy. And, you know, we can never not talk about immunotherapy when we talk about lung cancer. And we had some updates. I feel like it wasn't as exciting um, a year at ASCO for immunotherapy this year, very much my bias. Um, but we had updates from Keynote 189, which was a trial that looked at carboplatinum and pemetrexid with pembrolizumab that got pembrolizumab approval. Um, we had some three-year updates from CheckMet. Checkmate 227, which came just as nivolumab and ipilimumab um, got FDA approval as a first line option in patients who are PDL1 greater than 1%. So, Jyothi, what were you, your new patients in clinic? You now have a multitude of choices. There's not just one choice. When you looked at those trials, and I, I don't know if you want to discuss and help me describe some of those trials to our audience. What did you go with on Monday saying, here's what's different and what's new that we need to talk about and offer you as a, as a new standard of care? Sure. So the gates seem in many ways wide open, and, I, and I'm trying to make my decisions less arbitrary. So going in ASCO, we had ideas about patients with targetable mutations certainly go on, um, on a targeted therapy, patients who um, are ineligible for those. We sort of look at their their um, PDL one status to relegate whether we do single agent immunotherapy, chemotherapy with immunotherapy. And it was pretty relatively straightforward, unless someone had a real um, pushback or you know quality of life concerns about starting chemotherapy. If someone's number was greater than fifty percent, they got single agent pembrolizumab. If it was less than fifty percent you could get um, chemotherapy with pembrolizumab. And there are also other combinations with atezolizumab, but I think sort of most of us tend to do the drug that was um, approved first. 
So in the month and days preceding ASCO, there were two approvals in the frontline setting that I think are, are really important. So one was the updated, um, and what was presented at ASCO was the updated analysis of Checkmate 227. This is a trial that has been ongoing and I think has gotten a little bit, not a little, a fair bit of uh, sort of flat, you know, um, discussion about how the trial has morphed over time. Nevertheless, um, the regimen um, that was finally approved was uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab in um, patients who had PDL greater than one, ex expression greater than one. We have seen other dices of this population, or of this trial, and we know that th this can be a regimen that's quite active in patients with no expression of PDL and PDL zero. Um, but the FDA approval and the primary endpoint of the trial really focused on this population with some PDL expression. So that's what was approved. What we saw at ASCO, I think, was really exciting was um, the three year updates um, on this regimen. And, you know, a couple of things to me really stood out. One was that patients who got Ipinevo and had a, had a good response at six months seemed to sort of plateau for the next three years. So that early response sort of indicated this prolonged benefit um, from these drugs. Um, so I think that's really compelling because there's a subset of patients that do very well for a long time with both CTLA um, and PD inhibition. The other piece I think that um, was really um, exciting about sort of these regimens, again, even if we don't look at that sort of landmark analysis at six months, was the proportion of patients, about a third of patients on Ipinevo, regardless of how they did, continued um, with disease control at three years. And so I, certainly without chemotherapy, we thought that was pretty exciting in the entire um, population, greater than greater than 1%. Um, I think right before ASCO, there was another approval of chemotherapy with Ipi and Nevo. And, and Leora, maybe you want to talk about that because I think that's what I'm having. That's what probably is most exciting to me um, to how to sort of fit this in the paradigm, but the one that's most perplexing as well. Yeah, so that was the 9LA study, um, which looked at um, chemotherapy with or without nivolumab and ipilimumab um, and showed improved response rates, um, progression-free survival data compared um, to chemotherapy. And, you know, I think we've had a lot of trials that have have shown this. What was interesting to me in that study is the toxicities were really not that high, um, but patients only had two cycles of chemotherapy with nivolumab and ipilimumab and then continued with the nivolumab and ipilimumab. And so part of the thought behind that study was, could you also, a lot of the trials that we look at, we see a lot of patients who get single agent checkpoint inhibitors or even nivolumab and ipilimumab have this rapid progression. And so we didn't see as, you know, the question was, could you flatten that curve a little bit in the first two cycles and then maintain the responses with nivolumab and ipilimumab? You know, someone asked me um, the other day which combo I'm going to use, um, and I, I don't know that I'm going to jump to that, but the answer that I had from them is we have so many drugs with such similar data, and I said to them, I'm going to use the one that's least expensive, but they're all the same price right now. And, but, uh, you know, I, I'm curious to think, get your opinion on this, Ali, because I know this is probably something very important to our patients. Um, it's important to society, really, um, is the, the cost of care. That's where my Canadian training always comes back to me. Um, but, you know, I, I, we've got so much data now showing fairly similar outcomes. I actually would have been more excited if the FDA had approved nivolumab and ipilimumab in the pdl one zero patients because that would have given me a non-chemo regimen rather than getting another chemo, chemo regimen. So, Ali, did you hear much buzz from folks about these regimens? What are your thoughts about the cost of these different drugs? Um, because they are fairly cost prohibitive. Um, just curious how, how, what you thought of the data. Yeah, it's, you know, it's challenging because when we can't look at care without looking at cost of care. And yet we never want that to be the driver of the decision-making when we're balancing that against someone's life 
or someone's extended life expectancy. So it becomes a real stress point for patients and families wanting to have quality of life, wanting to have quantity of life, and also trying to make decisions when some of these treatments are incredibly cost prohibitive. Cancer care is expensive, and there are many organizations that are trying to support the and offset some of that funding, but that becomes very real uh, factors in decision making. One of the challenges is for patients to be able to get upfront true and static costs of what some of the treatment decisions are going to be, and they can't always get that information because there might be changes in cost or ancillary things that come up as they need more maybe um, supportive care as they're needing side effect management. And so even if they did have some of those static costs of treatment up front, it doesn't mean that's what's going to be the case over time. And so again, it comes into conversations. What do they have available? What are they willing to do? Um, talking with insurance providers, talking with their treatment providers. But it's really a hard thing when it comes down to cost. And is that gonna be the thing that keeps somebody alive or extends someone's life? Nobody wants to have to make that choice based on cost. So that's not a simple answer and there's not a simple pathway forward except ask a lot of questions, decide personally what you're willing to do and what is available to you and then work with your providing team to make the best choices that you can. Yeah, and you know, it, it's amazing to me to see how well our lung cancer patients are doing. You know, people are living for a long time. And so it's not like you can budget for a six month illness in stage four disease, because now patients with stage four disease, I have some patients at a decade. Um, that's because I've only been practicing on my own for just over a decade. And, you know, it's it's just, it's so good to see them and hear about their children and their grandchildren and their, their lives. You know, when people come and you're not talking about cancer therapy for the entire visit, you know that things are going well. Um, but we, I'm, I'm hoping that what happens in lung cancer is what happened in hepatitis when we had so many disease drugs for the same indication. Um, we, we suddenly got drugs that were affordable one of the questions that came through um, was, um, what about immunotherapy for patients with KRAS mutations? Um, did we see any new data this year? You know, last year, um, we saw a really nice analysis from Dr. Skalidis, who looked at patients who were getting chemotherapy with immunotherapy. Maybe these patients had KRAS mutations, but maybe they also had LKB1 or STK11. And his data showed us that those patients who had those co-mutations Maybe they didn't do as well with immunotherapy and we needed to be thinking about other um, treatment options. Um, I don't remember seeing any great updates for immunotherapy with KRAS mutations, but Jyothi, maybe you wanna talk about some of the data that we saw with the new KRAS inhibitors um, that seem to be coming down the pipeline um, at ASCO this year. Sure. So certainly, so we know that KRAS mutations are quite common and that there are a number of different subtypes. Um, the most common KRAS mutation that we see is G12C. And so there, um, there has been, I think for the past year, uh, a lot of multiple presentations about um, AMG 510, as well as, as some smaller ones about a Marathi compound. These are oral drugs that um, appear to have really good efficacy. The numbers are small. Um, I think questions about durability of response remain. Um, this year at ASCO, we saw um, AMG in other tumor types. So we saw some res uh, response in small cell as well as in colon cancer. Um, an idea that this is a legitimate pathway, but also understanding that perhaps these drugs are less effective in colon cancer and lung, than in lung cancer, and it may be because of downstream pathways. So certainly I think a, a lot there to continue to learn about, and we'll see what some of these registration trials look like. There was, um, there was some information about um, STK, and these are numbers that we get um, these are on most of our mutation panels. We have a lot of mutations, and we think that we may be able to understand immune response. 
I get STK as part of my panel um, at Northwestern, and, and I think most commercial vendors give it as well. Thus far, I have not used it to um, assign therapy. I've used it as part of a clinical trial. Um, there, there, there were um, a couple of studies suggesting that um, STK and other mutations may be more prognostic than predictive of response to certain drugs. So it may be that these similar mutations make the response to immunotherapy less effective, but I think it needs a, a lot further study. So at this juncture, if someone had an STK mutation, I wouldn't hold immunotherapy. I, just, I don't feel like I have enough information. I think it'd be... Um, yeah, I'm actually more likely to, I wouldn't hold it, but I'm more likely to give it in combination with chemotherapy. Um, that's, that's sort of being the, the way I've looked at those, those, um, those reports that we get on our patients. I I'd uh, agree, absolutely agree with that. One of the other exciting presentations that I um, think I put up there in my top five, although it wasn't in the lung session, was the antibody drug con conjugate in the DESTINY-1 trial, and I know I'm going to butcher this name, um, trastuzumab durextican or durextican, or I'm sure we're going to come up with a nice short form for it. So, you know, we got excited a few years ago about DLL3 and the ADC with Rova-T that look good in phase one, but seem to have these toxicity signals and fell apart. But the DESTINY-1 trial looked at this agent that is currently approved in breast cancer patients. So I feel like we've got more safety data. And it looked in patients with HER2 mutations. And we saw a response rate over 60%. We saw a PFS of around 14 months. Is this something that you're, you're excited about that you think we're gonna see more of? This was in a combined GI and lung cancer patient population. So you know, small numbers, it was second line, it wasn't first. But have we finally got a targeted agent for HER2 positive patients, do you think? HER2 um, mutations have been really tough. Often they're lumped in on these clinical trials uh, with EGFR, exon 20. Um, what we've seen is most of the TKIs that have been tested are minimally effective, come with toxicities. It just is a, it's a, it's a tough nut to crack in many ways. So certainly I think we're really excited about this ADC. There was some pneumonitis in the study, um, a little bit more than we usually see, about 5%. So I think that needs to be sorted out. The numbers were small, but certainly how great to have a, a, a drug for this distinct subset. Um, and I'm anxious to see sort of to watch it move forward um, in larger trials. Yeah, and I'm, I'm quite curious to see um, for those patients who got pneumonitis, had they got immunotherapy before? Um, and so is it a combo of, um, of the ADCs um, with, the, with, the, uh, with the chemo? Ali, should we be trying to advocate to get this drug for our patient when it's not FDA approved? Or should we tell our patients, hold your horses? You know, I, I actually had a HER2 positive patient in clinic on Monday who's on a clinical trial. And I kind of mentioned the ASCO data because, you know, I, I spent the whole weekend watching Zoom with my kids, um, ASCO on Zoom. And so, uh, you know, it, what do you think we should do for our patients with this drug, or do we still need to wait for more data? Oh, Allie, I think you're on mute. I am, thank you. Anytime there's an opportunity to advocate on behalf of treatment regimens that there's data to prove it or sufficient things to say we need more, absolutely. Taking that approach of advocacy with all of the different um, avenues that you have, I think it's it brings the point that patients and families are hearing some of this information, they're getting excited, and they're getting really hopeful. And that's a huge thing is there's hope associated with some of these new regimens. And then it's also taking away that hope and feeling pretty heartbreaking when they hear, oh, but we can't get it. Right, So I think it is a really important thing to be aware when you offer a potential treatment regimen that's not actually available, how that might be impacting the emotional well-being and the hope of a patient and the family of what might be available. Because what they're invested in is their life. They want to live, right? Patients and families are involved with the treatment and doing these things because they want to live. And so hearing that there's a treatment that's not available to them that might actually serve them, 
is a really hard place to sit for a patient. So anything that you can do as physicians to advocate and to create access to this treatment is incredibly important. And I would say yes every time. Yeah, I think another reason to keep encouraging our patients to go on clinical trials, and I, I feel like in the lung cancer community, we're, we're very lucky. It's a collaborative group. And if we hear about something that's better than what we have down the road or across state lines, if you're allowed across the state lines right now, um, then you know I, I think it's a reason to, to send those patients. So Jyothi, we have a question from a patient. If someone has exhausted their TK options and their PDL one score is zero, um, do any of the new approvals apply? So should that patient get Nevo and IPI or should they get chemotherapy with Nevo and IPI? Um, what can we offer? Because we've heard a lot, we've seen data out of some different institutions showing that patients who have driver mutations maybe don't derive as much benefit um, from treatment with checkpoint inhibitors. Um, what, what would you tell this patient? What, what, what would you recommend? Sure, it's tough because we really don't have very much data. So we know with single agent PD1 inhibitors or PDL1 inhibitors, the response rate um, in patients with a driver mutation, and not all driver mutations, let me sort of back step back a little bit and say EGFR, ALK, and ROS1, we have pretty good data about. Um, but their response to single agent immunotherapy is, is less exciting. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, Matt Hellman presented data with IPI and Nevo in patients who were sort of post-TKI, and, and there was certainly um, some feeling that some patients with EGFR mutations who, um, who had progressed were having responses. Honestly, um, I think as that data has matured, many of us have felt that, that maybe that was um, just early numbers and, and it hasn't matured as nicely. It's tough also because the FDA approval for carboplatin, pemetrexid, and pembrolizumab excluded these patients. And we know that carboplatin and pemetrexid is sort of a backbone for patients after um, failing or after the failure of TKIs um, in patients with driver mutations. Um, so we've kind of, we've been left um, with the the only real data we have, which is a combination of carboplatin, paclitaxel, bevacizumab, and neftizolizumab in these patients. And certainly we know that the addition of anti-VEGF with bevacizumab plus atezolizumab improves outcome in this subset of patients. The, the improvement is, a, I think, a little bit more modest, and the numbers continue to be small. But this is an area of active investigation. So there's um, there are a couple of trials right now that are looking at, at these particular populations to better define what um, response would look like and whether or not we could sort of switch chemotherapy backbone. So I'm optimistic that we'll have more agents. Um, currently, what do I do off of a trial for many patients? I'll, for a patient with an EGFR mutation, often I'll actually continue um, the osimertinib and add chemotherapy, sometimes with or without bevacizumab. Um, it's really, it, it depends a lot on um, what burden of disease they have. Generally, I think our paradigm has shifted a lot in the past several years. If a patient develops resistance, we try to do another biopsy to understand the mechanism of acquired resistance and whether we can use two targeted therapies to overcome that resistance. Um, or whether or not systemic chemotherapy um, is appropriate, and then we sort of add on to it. You know, it's um, sort of the, the paradigm I have is that really, you know, we want to think about the longest time that we can have disease control because the science is evolving so rapidly, the cadre of clinical trials, and our really discovery of understanding mechanisms of resistance is changing dramatically. Um, in years. So even if a patient can go on chemotherapy for a year or so on a regimen that's effective and has low toxicity, and yes, it's a drag getting infusional therapy after you've been on um, oral chemotherapy, but if we can get even a year, I, you know, I, I'm optimistic that the science evolves in that time. And certainly we're seeing that more and more with the number of agents that we're bringing from bench to bedside. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know what I always worry about when I give a patient with a, t uh, a mutation, a, a checkpoint inhibitor is 
when I want to give them another TKI because there's something newer or better, they might have more toxicity to that um, TKI. So, um, Ali, uh, as Jyoti mentioned, we're looking for a longer time with um, disease control and because lung cancer patients have such a better prognosis, that's always the first thing I tell my patients. So as someone who's working with people who are impacted with cancer, who are specifically supporting their emotional well-being, what, what do you want people to know? Um, what, what's important for people who are listening to us today to think about for these patients? Yeah, so I hope is one of the things that first comes to mind, how important and how personal hope is, that hope means something different to every person. And so for all of the healthcare providers, as well as the families and patients living with and impacted by lung cancer to really be willing to bring hope into the conversation and into the care plan and into their daily lives as a way of coping with a cancer diagnosis. Let's be clear, a cancer diagnosis at its basic is a life disruption. And it has various implications and magnitude for each individual. And there is likely going to be emotional impact. It doesn't mean that someone can't develop coping mechanisms and skills to deal with and respond to the impact of a cancer diagnosis. But I think as someone who's a clinical social worker, again, working with people around emotions, every day I'm helping people learn how to feel their feelings around a diagnosis, how to create their own roadmap for what it means to stay engaged in care and to develop coping mechanisms that help them tolerate treatment, help them stay engaged in day-to-day -day life and have meaningful quality of life and meaningful personal connections. So another thing I'd like to really remind people of is the power of community. So tonight, we're all coming together to share information, to ask questions. And I want to remind everybody that there is a lot of incredible online support, in-person support around the lung cancer community. As a representative of the Medical Advisory Review Board with the Lung Cancer Research Foundation, I know they're one of the organizations that's doing a lot to fund research, to provide access to information to patients and families they have peer support, peer mentors for both caregivers and patients. And in addition to the Lung Cancer Research Foundation, Cure Magazine is a huge source of information and community. So there's so much out there and available. And I want to remind people to use the connection to community and use the connection to information for their own well-being and for their own care and treatment decisions and quality of life. It's so important that we look at the broader scope of care to include all of these aspects. And I want patients and healthcare providers to leave feeling empowered that they have the ability to participate, to make change in individual lives and that it really does matter. Absolutely. And, you know, sorry, go ahead, Jyothi. I was going to say that it's such a striking, like so important for us to realize like this has been th these past months for all of us have been so disrupted our, our sort of the, um, the communities we surround ourselves with our um, you know, all of our bolsters and our emotional well-being, sort of even that, that physical sense of being close with people has been so disrupted. And, you know, it, this can be a lonely disease. And I would, and I think during this pandemic, it's even lonelier. One of the most important studies I actually want to highlight is Leora um, got to present sort of an international collaboration that she's leading, looking at the effect of, of coronavirus in patients with thoracic cancers. And that kicked off all of ASCO, right? I mean, it was one of, it was one of the most important pieces is, um, and the pandemic disrupted not only um, our lives, but also this great meeting. So, Leora, you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, and I can probably answer one of the questions that came up about our lung cancer patients prone to COVID. Um, so, you know, it, it, we, when the pandemic started, we, we didn't know how long this was going to go on for. Um, and so uh, we were sitting here in the U.S. waiting um, I feel like we're sitting in Nashville a little bit, still waiting to see what happens. Um, 
But uh, Marina Garasino, who is a lovely medical oncologist in Milan, um, sent an email out to 50 of her friends, which I think goes to show the collaborative environment of the lung cancer community, because there's not a lot of groups that could do this the way it happened. And she said that what's happening is, is terrible for our patients. Not only am I worried about how they're doing, but I'm worried about in delaying their care and we need to collect data. So, you know, we were here in Nashville and I said, well, clinics are half closed and I can't get uh, people to come in and we, we can do this, we can collect the data. And, you know, I hope it's a lesson to companies for future clinical trials, because within two days we had established a case report form and, you know, within a week of us deciding to do it, we had IRB approval at our university and Italy actually had IRB approval at a whole country, for a whole country. And uh, within about six weeks, we've collected, we had collected data on six, 400 consecutive patients who were diagnosed with COVID and lung cancer. Now, I, I don't want people to hear the data and be, I, I think there's concern, but I don't want it to be the wrong sort of concern. And, and what we found is in patients with lung cancer who developed COVID-19, that the mortality was much higher than what we expected and higher than we've seen in other tumor types, CCC. CCC19 is another collaboration that's ongoing across the US. They had data on about 1,000 lung cancer patients presented at ASCO. Uh, sorry, 1,000 patients presented at ASCO, about 100 had lung cancer. And they had about an 18% mortality, and we had a 35% mortality in our patients. We were looking at, you know, what were the risk factors associated with mortality? You know, the average patient was uh, over 60 years old that was enrolled in our um, database. The um, the majority of patients, which was really surprising to me, were either had not been treated, so they were getting diagnosed with lung cancer at the same time as they got COVID, um, or they were on their first line therapy, which meant that their oncologist thought that there was a good reason to be on treatment and that there was hope and option for those patients. So it's not like these were patients who were sicker from their lung cancer and later line therapy. We found that patients who were older, over 65, who were maybe not quite as fit, um, who were on higher doses of steroids um, and had, who had had either chemotherapy by itself or chemotherapy with immunotherapy were at higher risk of dying from COVID. Now, I think there are two important messages that came out from this. Um, one is that we need to be concerned about our lung cancer patients. And, but I think importantly, we need to realize that this initial group of data was at the height of the pandemic in certain cities definitely in Italy, definitely in France and Spain, where some of this original data came from, as well as um, some sites in the US, such as New York. We are now up to over 600 patients, um, and our goal is to get over 1,000 to better understand some of this. And we're starting to see and screen some of the asymptomatic patients at our centers. What it said to me is we mustn't stop giving our patients the first best therapy. You know, if we think that chemotherapy is gonna be beneficial for our patients, if we think chemotherapy and immunotherapy is the right treatment to do, don't forego the chemotherapy and just give the immunotherapy because sometimes we've got one chance at really controlling the disease, but we need to minimize the patient's interaction with the healthcare system. Um, so don't bring patients in for weekly labs. They don't need it. You know, Let them come in once, get their treatment, go home, follow up on the phone, follow up on telehealth, follow up however your different institution is able to do it. But I think that we still need to offer our patients the best level of care. Um, what we've seen in the Netherlands, which is um, scary, and I think we're gonna see the same thing here, is that the number of patients going in for screening has decreased. Um, and that is a big concern because you know, last year we had improvements in cancer mortality, specifically due to lung cancer. Are we going to see worsening cancer mortality when we get the lung cancer statistics in the next two or three years as patients delay um, care? Um, and I, I, I do worry about that. But, you know, I think what, what Terrible did tell us is that our patients are at risk. When they get chemotherapy, you should continue social distancing, even if your city or country are opening up. You should continue to be careful. You do need to be that little bit more rig rigid in how you're living your life right now. Because to beat the cancer, so to speak, or get that cancer out of control, under control, to die from this virus just seems so not fair for, for our patient population. 
Um, Ali, what what are you what are you telling patients who are worried about going to their doctor or and Jothi, you know, Chicago is not like Nashville. We have no public transit. You probably have a lot of patients taking cabs and public transit to get to Northwestern. You know, what are you guys telling patients out there from the TerraVault data? So certainly, you know, our experience at Northwestern has been that we've actually seen very few patients with lung cancer and COVID in Chicago, I think really did a great job in flattening the curve. Um, so we, although saw a big spike, it was much less than projected. And I think social distancing has worked. I'll say over and over, you know, many of us in healthcare are part um, are parts of clinical trials. I'm getting my serology tested often. I'm high risk. I'm going to the hospital. I volunteered in the inpatient service. I think that in the hospital and at points of healthcare, I actually feel are quite safe um, because there's a code of conduct. Everyone is screened for symptoms. People wear, you know, there's hygiene. People wear masks. And so um, the, my message to patients is that if you need care, you need to come to the hospital um, because it's actually a, a pretty safe place. The other piece is, um, you know, sort of the silver lining of all of this is that I think we've gotten much more creative in how we deliver care. It's mm -hmm. much more patient focused. Patients come to the hospital at points of need. I'm not doing extraneous visits and blood tests if patients don't need something from me or don't need an intervention. And congruent with this was also that we had some um, changes in the FDA label for um, dosing of certain immunotherapies. So, so suddenly, MAB could be atezolizumab and dervalumab in small cell lung cancer could be given every four weeks instead of every three weeks. So. Certainly, I think there's an effort to streamline care. Um, the FDA has issued a bunch of guidance about clinical trials. Um, we may be able to get blood draws and um, imaging at um, sites off of the study site. You know, so I think there are a lot of things that will come from this that are much more patient focused and will make trials easy to do in the long run. Um, but, you know, the, I think our immediate crisis is how do we keep people safe? How do we assure people that if they have symptoms, they need to come to the hospital and engage um, with medical care? Because I actually think right now most of the hospitals are pretty safe. Are you um, swabbing? We're swabbing patients before they start any therapy. Are you doing similar things um, at Northwestern right now? We, we are. So patients... Um, Patients are tested um, before procedures and bef at the start of therapy. Ali, what are you, what are you hearing from patients? What are the big questions? How how can the healthcare providers support the patients? How can the patients' families support them um, during yeah. during this time? So there's a lot of uncertainty, and uncertainty equals a lot of fear. And so some of the ways that I'm recommending is what are the ways to reduce that fear and one of those things is get informed get accurate up-to-date reliable information and then do the due diligence to check it out with your healthcare providers right that's what you are here for is to help patients understand their risk understand care protocols understand the potential impact when some of these care protocols might change Right, because even when a patient is used to having a certain dosage or a certain time frame of treatment regimen, that becomes security, right? And then when you switch that, that can inadvertently increase fear and distress. And so it's really important for patients to ask, how might this change either my quality of life or my survival or what else is going to change? And so conversations and communications around information, whether you're reading studies online, whether you're hearing things, because the cancer community is so connected. So patients are also hearing information from each other about what's happening where they live. And as the two of you who are sitting in reputable institutions in different states, you're even checking out. What are you guys doing? Are you swabbing? Are you not swabbing? So I think that even raises the point that patients might be hearing 
different things based on where other people are sitting in the world. And it's still critical to bring it back to their healthcare providers to check it out as it relates to their institutions, their care teams, and their personal history. That will help reduce some confusion and ideally also reduce fear associated with the uncertainty and the unknowns. Because what I'm hearing in this conversation today is how much the two of you are tapped into up-to-date information. And so I send all the people I'm working with, talk to your healthcare team. If you have questions, whether you're in active care or not, follow back up with the people that are gonna specifically answer it as it relates to you. Definitely, and I, I think I'm always looking out for those updates. So, Jyothi, here's a question that came through. Um, for a patient who is on uh, Keytruda or pembrolizumab and they've progressed, should they avoid chemotherapy? Um, you know, clinical trials are sparse right now. We're slowly, a lot of companies shut down their trials. They're slowly opening them up. What, what second-line treatment would you offer them, and is, is chemotherapy a bad idea and they should stay with pembrolizumab? So certainly um, if the pembrolizumab is no longer working or the tuzolizumab is no longer, longer working, then I would advocate for trying something else. And although chemotherapy for someone who's been on an oral agent you know, is really daunting, it's quite effective. And it's a, you know, I have many patients who have good quality of life, minimal fatigue, minimal toxicity from chemotherapy. And it may be as sort of a bridge to next treatments. Often, um, clinical trials will recommend immunotherapy as well as a platinum um, treatment prior to enrollment on, on a clinical trial. Um, clinical trials are, you know, in although medical research has stalled, um, by and large, lung can or cancer trials have continued because often being on a clinical trial is the best available option or the best therapy. So I think those will be prioritized at most institutions to open up. But certainly, I think chemotherapy can be effective. There is a large um, effort now um, called the Insignia trial, in which patients with with PD with some PDL expression either get pembrolizumab and then switch to adding chemotherapy to the pembrolizumab if it doesn't work or completely switching onto um, chemotherapy alone and foregoing further pembrolizumab. So certainly I think we'll have clarity around these in, in um, the next years, um, but definitely a work in progress. Um, understand also that, you know, we have, I think a couple of years ago, talked a lot about pseudo progression and a patient who was having evidence of the cancer progressing may actually be benefiting and to just be patient. I think it's, it's I'm holding on to something because it's comfortable and not working. Um, it's probably not serving anyone um, that well and probably the number of patients who have pseudo progression and are really benefiting is quite small. Um, so, so I would say take the plunge and consider it and more clinical trials to follow. Definitely. And we had a similar question from someone who said they are responding to pembrolizumab, what comes next? And they have 100% PDL one expression. I'm hoping that you don't need that what comes next, but I think that uh, Jyothi covered that. You know, we, we don't have a lot of time, but the last thing I, I wanted to cover, because it's something that's near and dear to my heart where I live is small cell. Um, and we had some updates at ASCO for patients who had small cell lung cancer. Um, we had updates um, from the Caspian study. This was a trial that looked at chemotherapy with or without dervalimab for patients with small cell lung cancer. There was an update for patients who had uh, brain metastases that were untreated. Um, and the trial showed us that dervalimab did have a benefit in those patients. Um, even if they had untreated brain metastases. And we also had updated data from Keynote 604, which was the randomized phase three trial that looked at chemotherapy with or without um, pembrolizumab, which showed an improvement in progression-free survival, but there was not an improvement in overall survival. When you looked at ASCO, did any of this sort of change what you're doing for your patients with small cell lung cancer? If they present and they have brain metastases, 
it's a tough one. Are you recommending don't radiate, let's do chemo and see what happens? Uh, how, how are you approaching those those uh, patients after ASCO, Jyothi? So certainly I think, it, you know, we finally changed paradigms for patients with small cell lung cancer over the past year or so. So um, with the uh, Derva data, I had been let, enrolling patients um, with clinical trials or treating patients, um, excuse me, with brain metastasis um, with Derva up front. I think the data is... Um, now a little bit more grounded, and I feel quite comfortable treating those patients. I think sort of the takeaways for me in small cell was that although the pembrolizumab trial was negative, the curves looked a lot like what we've seen with other regimens, and so I think IO and chemotherapy is effective for this group of patients. I think it was probably a statistical issue or you know maybe a little bit of bad luck that the trial wasn't positive in OS. The other piece was that... Um, and Caspian for tremolilumab in combination with dervalumab did not um, was a negative trial. And in fact, I wonder if we actually hurt some patients with the addition of the fourth drug. Um, that's tough because we know CTL4 inhibition with PD inhibition. Um, maybe Nevo is certainly a, a group of, of patients that have long-term survival. And so sort of figuring out when these drugs should be given, I think, still remains to be seen. Yeah, so that, that was sort of a question that came up in, in clinic when I was talking to my research nurses because the Adriatic trial is open. Um, and what the Adriatic trial is, is a trial that's giving patients chemo radiation for small cell. And once treatment's finishing, they're either being randomized to receive placebo, um, dervalumab or dervalumab and tremolumumab. And what we're hoping to see from this trial is the same benefit that we saw in non-small cell lung cancer that really led to the approval of immunotherapy for a year after treatment. Ali, do you think patients will have a reservation about getting dervalumab and tremolumumab now, seeing that the Caspian study was negative? Or do we say, well, that was with chemo, so we still need to look at this question because we, we don't have the answers. Are, are people talking about the small cell data? Have you heard any concerns in the, in the cancer community? People are talking about it because, of course, there's questions. As you pointed out, there's not a clear answer. There are still questions. And so, again, it comes to talking. I, I feel like I keep saying this, but it's really the most important thing is to be in close communication with your healthcare team, to be making decisions based on your personal history, your personal risk factors, and your personal responses to decide what's the best choice or what's the choice that feels most aligned for where you're at and what's what you're trying to accomplish and what the goals of care are. So there's always going to be questions um, when there's no one way. And through conversation and communication and close monitoring, I think those are the best ways to create the path forward. Absolutely. And Jyothi, I think we got time for one more question. Um, so speaking of the Pacific data um, and looking at the osimertinib data for patients who got chemo and radiation therapy, should we be thinking about osimertinib um, for our patients who got chemo radiation therapy because they're such high risk? There is a trial that is ongoing. You know, it, it's amazing to me how quickly immunotherapy trials close and open and you know for a while I feel like there was TKI uh, just fatigue or less excitement and suddenly we're excited about TKIs again. Um, I'm excited about anything with lung cancer really that moves that curve forward and so what what do I do with my patients? Do I say well we don't know so let's keep up with the dervalumab or should I, should I talk to my patient about this? Again as Ali mentioned it's not an FDA approved indication. We don't have the data yet. So I, certainly in Pacific, the number of patients with EGFR mutations was quite small. We didn't know it for a huge proportion of patients. There looks to be a trend, but it's a really wide confidence interval. Um, I guess mechanistically, to me, it makes more sense that probably a TKI should be appropriate there, but we don't have the data. And in fact, when we looked at a TKI after chemo radiation in unselected patients, we actually hurt those patients. Um, in an older gefitinib study. And so I, my sense is that the jury is still out. Um, perhaps I'm less willing or 
my threshold to stop dervalumab in these patients might be a little bit higher. So you develop a little bit of pneumonitis and I'll probably hold off. But Leora, what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm saying the same thing. We don't have the data. We don't know what to do. Um, I know that certain people are, are jumping on that, but I think we need to wait because um, we don't want to harm our patients and osimertinib can cause pneumonitis. Um, and so, you know, starting that immediately after could, could put our patients um, just just as much at risk. In the last few minute or second, Ali, what are you most excited or what you're most looking forward to for our patients, you know, coming up in, in the, you know, for the rest of 2020, besides the vaccine? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's really the breadth and the width of treatment options that are available. There's so much possible and that equals longer life, better quality of life. And all of those things are really exciting that the lung cancer community continues to have possible options. Um, and that's really exciting, you know, that people are putting a lot of investment, a lot of money, a lot of time and research into the lung cancer community because it's an important population of people that deserve this kind of attention and these treatment options. So I'm excited about all the possibilities. Josie, how about you? So I think there's been a sea change in the past few years, and it's high time, right? I mean, we've put in sort of, we've worked on that foundational science, patients have volunteered to be in clinical trials and to work with us. But now we're talking about really understanding what regimen to treat or the best data that we'll have for regimens to treat patients with stage four lung cancer won't be really until even five years. Right, we're seeing all of these immunotherapies, immunochemotherapy regimens, and we have data now at three years. Now we're saying it really depends on what that tail of the curve looks like. So, bringing um, better therapies and really thinking about a much more uh, a longer patient journey, multiple options, holding off on toxicity and keeping patients well as the science evolves, is what gets me excited. With you know a really great group of collaborators. And I think that's been sort of the story of 2020 is how people have pulled together during these tough times. Thanks, science. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I hope those people listening out there, you know, come back to clinic. You know, you're, we're, we're here to take care of you. We want you to be safe. And we, we don't want you to neglect your cancer care because you have good options. And if you know people who qualify for screening, make them go get that CT scan because um, screening CTs can save lives. So I want to thank our panelists and the audience for attending and for participating in today's events. Um, I want to thank CURE and our sponsors, AstraZeneca and the Lung Cancer Research Foundation for making today's educational session uh, webcast possible. Um, and I hope to see you all next time. Uh, have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you.